they are moving, but the movement of the bottom 40 is much slower. And the question for Indonesia uh, is actually how you are going to create more resiliency in terms of the growth that is able to create job and reduce poverty. And this is something not easy for Indonesia, which is still very much affected by commodity. In Indonesia today, the problem not really money, but how you design a program that will make sure that especially the bottom 40 will actually enjoy it. Small, medium enterprises, financial inclusion, we actually have quite huge, in this case, doubling the scale for those who are receiving support, assistance, or in financial access for women. That is something that will reduce the tension or what you call it the impatience, the expectation. But still, when you are dealing with a policy making environment today, which is really affected by the speed of the information and technology, you are actually have a very huge potential mismatch between people's expectation and the ability to deliver. It's been described as the worst economic downturn since the 1998 Asian financial crisis. COVID-19 has brought the Indonesian economy to its knees. It has also reversed decades of progress in Southeast Asia's largest economy. More than 6 million jobs have been lost and 5 million more Indonesians have fallen into poverty. We're talking about uh, the poor, but they will take the heaviest burden from the crisis. Satu hari, 30,000, 50,000, sedangkan ada yang punya anak dua, punya anak tiga. Will COVID-19 outbreak trigger another Asian financial crisis and push millions of Indonesians into extreme poverty? Can Indonesia survive the challenge and recover from the devastating impact of the pandemic? It's 10 a.m. in Jakarta, Indonesia's bustling capital of more than 10 million people. 30-year-old food seller Hissa Mazruri is busy cleaning raw chickens in this crowded neighborhood in the western part of the city. Helping his wife Titin has become part of his daily routine now, especially since the pandemic began five months ago. It's one way of earning an extra income for the family. The couple is selling ayam geprek. It's a popular grilled chicken dish eaten with rice and spicy condiments made of red chilies. Despite working for 18 hours a day, Hisam barely makes enough money to support his small family, especially during the pandemic. Penghasilan saya turun hampir 60 sampai 70 persen. Yang tadinya bisa 400, 500 sekarang cari 100 ribu aja susah. Terkadang untuk beli gas, bayar air, kadang-kadang sahabat sana, sahabat sini. Ngutang dulu lah, ngambil dulu, bayar besok. Hisam can't afford to give up his old job as an app-based motorcycle taxi driver, popularly known as Ojek in Indonesia. That's because the family cannot live off on just one source of income. Since COVID-19 wreaked havoc on the economy, he doesn't get enough passengers to ferry them around the city center. The bulk of his regular customers have either been laid off or told to work from home. Kalau untuk kayak seperti kami, ojek online itu kan kita menga, apa ya? Kita berjalan itu kan dari anak-anak sekolah, orang-orang kantor, orang-orang kerja, gitu, yang setiap hari naik ojek. Nah, sedangkan mereka semua diliburin. Kita mau narik apa? Kita ada layanan GrabFood atau GoFood. Orang-orangnya aja udah susah cari uang. Mereka lebih milih beli di belanja di pasar, masak di rumah. Restoran semua sepi. Saya juga uh, ayam geprek saya udah masuk online juga. Satu minggu itu satu order. Itu pun yang order kawan saya. Hisam lives with his wife and their six-year-old boy in a rented room, measuring 2.5 by 3 meters. His parents occupy a room next door. Debt collectors often come knocking at his door, demanding money that he still owes a bank after his garment business collapsed two years ago. 
he was recently forced to sell his television set to help repay the debt. On top of his monthly expenses running his grilled chicken business, he still has to pay his rent, electricity bills, as well as his son's education. He now has run out of things to sell to help cover his debts. Kalau sampai misalnya motor yang saya jadiin buat kaki saya itu saya jadiin saya nggak mungkin kan saya dari sini ke tempat jualan saya jalan kaki kan nggak mungkin. Kalau harus ngongkos pakai baja atau apa itu kan biayanya lebih mahal lagi. Yang bisa dikatakan tuh sekarat. Kalau ibarat orang sakit itu udah sekarat. Satu hari tiga puluh ribu lima puluh ribu. Sedangkan ada yang punya anak dua, punya anak tiga. Nggak kebayang di Jakarta punya penghasilan segitu. Ada beberapa yang sampai nggak berani pulang ke rumah. Nggak berani pulang ke rumah karena nggak bawa uang. Dia bingung mesti jawab apa sama istrinya, mesti ngomong apa sama anak-anaknya. According to the Indonesian government, the national poverty line is set around 31 US dollars per capita per month, or about a dollar a day. The restrictions on movements and other social distancing measures have killed businesses. Indonesia's GDP plunged 5.32% in the second quarter, its first contraction in more than 20 years. The figure is worse than the government's initial estimate of 4.3%. And despite the allocation of about 700 trillion rupiah or 48 billion US dollars worth of stimulus measures, they're barely enough to cover the needs of the people. At least 5 million more people have now fallen below the poverty line as a result of the pandemic. The poverty incidence may increase from currently 9.3%. The 4% to 11.3 to 12.8, depending on the COVID scenario. So that would uh, that would mean uh, at least an additional five million uh, people may go um, below the poverty line. And another concern is the um, large number of informal workers in Indonesia. Um, that uh, a lot of people may be pushed from formal employment into informal employment, and and again, that will make them increasingly vulnerable. Only two years ago, Indonesia made history when it successfully reduced poverty rate to a single digit for the first time since independence in 1945. It cut the poverty rate by half since 1999 to 9.4% in 2019. But now, the Indonesian economy is creaking again under the weight of COVID-19. The country's impressive poverty eradication effort has been pushed back by at least a decade. The government has forecast full-year growth of 1% at best this year, or a full-year contraction of 0.4% at worst. This compares with 5.02% growth last year. Less people are working and for quite some time, all of the OJEC driver, motorcycle taxi drivers disappearing from Jakarta, but now they are coming back, especially after Idul Fitri. Uh, there's a lot of people right now just hanging out on the uh, street side, uh, have no job. I think that in the last 20 years, the growing number of middle class uh, and especially the people who are living the poverty and then go into the uh, lower middle class status, which is around 55 million uh, people. But these are the segment of society, the most vulnerable. I think uh, the, the risk for them to just go back to poverty is very high. The World Bank has warned that COVID-19 could push up to 100 million people around the world into extreme poverty. In Indonesia, if the poverty rate rises to as high as 13% as forecast, an additional 5 million people will fall into poverty. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of uncertainty about uh, how long this, this pandemic is going to, uh, to last. There's a lot of uncertainty about the impact on, on the economy, uh, to what extent there will be new uh, social distancing measures imposed, to what extent there will be an 
impact on tourism revenues, on you know commodity prices. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of uncertainty and there are risks. On Lembata, a dry island around 2,600 kilometers east of Jakarta, there are some 14,000 people who eke out a living as farmers and fishermen. But life has become much harder for them since the outbreak began five months ago. The COVID-19 pandemic has restricted movements of people from nearby islands, making it difficult for them to sell fresh fish, meat, produce and other perishable goods to their customers. 48-year-old Fajaria Jari is able to sell around one US dollar worth of fish on a good day. But that's no longer the case today, since the pandemic scares away many people from her stall. With the closure of restaurants and shopping malls as a result of the social distancing measures, the demand for fish has also plunged drastically. And that has caused concerns among fishermen due to the sudden dip in their incomes. Kondisi kalau COVID ini berlarut berlarut terus berarti kami sangat khawatir karena ke pasar juga pasar sepi ikan kami punya tidak dibeli dan datang juga air juga kondisi begini air juga mahal begini berarti kami sangat khawatir dengan kondisi sekarang ini. Kondisi saat ini curah hujan juga kurang, jadi kami gagal panen di pertanian itu. Dan kami ke laut juga, situasi di laut ombak terlalu besar, dan di laut tidak memungkinkan, jadi pendapatan ikan di laut juga sedikit saja. To supplement her meager income, she and dozens of other women on the island continue the tradition of weaving Lambata's famous ikat textiles. The women also grow cotton, a raw material for weaving for future investment. But selling the textiles to collectors outside the remote island is challenging because of the high transport costs. Back in Jakarta, Hisam and his wife are getting ready to sell their grilled chicken, hoping that today will be a lot better than the day before. Habis, ya pusing lagi. Harus bagaimana lagi? Cuman untungnya orang pasar kan udah kenal sama kita, jadi ada kurang-kurang sedikit ya mereka masih bisa ngerti lah. Karena memang keadaan semua rata-rata. With so many Indonesians struggling to overcome the crisis at the moment, what will their future look like? Will the situation become a lot worse before it gets better? And is the country that survived the Asian financial crisis in 1998 better prepared to tackle the challenge this time round? May 1998. It's regarded as one of the worst time periods in Indonesian history. Indonesia was then caught up in a maelstrom of the Asian financial crisis. Its currency, the rupiah, lost 80% of its value. Growth contracted by 14%. Inflation soared to over 65%. Public anger soon boiled over and Jakarta descended into chaos and turmoil as Indonesians vented their rage over soaring prices of basic essentials and rampant corruption. More than 1,000 people were killed in the unrest. It also forced the resignation of President Suharto after more than three decades in power. Twenty years on, Indonesians still remember how the crisis plunged the nation into one of its darkest days in history. Torikim was a Bajaj driver during Indonesia's dark days in 1998. At 56, he still drives a three-wheel taxi to earn a living. Ironically, in spite of the violence and turmoil in the days leading to the fall of President Suharto, he still feels that the current crisis is far worse than what he had experienced back in 1998. In the 1998, it was a crisis, 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 it was a crisis,
bebas berkeliaran, bebas bergaul kan. Ibaratnya bisa sono sini, utang pinjam masih bisa. Kalau kalau kayak sekarang, orang kerja, diperhentiin PSBB, aktivitas, jaga jarak, bahkan ibadah pun dibatasi. Itulah orang semua takut. Yang punya mungkin enak, bagi yang nggak punya. Tori Kim knows the streets of Jakarta like the back of his hand. He's been driving Bajaj since 1994, taking passengers through the back streets to avoid the city's notorious traffic jams. To support his wife, son and grandson, Tori Kim has no choice but to continue transporting commuters in his old motorized rickshaw, even though he's constantly in pain. His right index finger was punctured by a wood splinter while he was making a small wooden table at his house. The infected area has now become sore and swollen. But to him, the physical pain is nothing compared to what he's mentally going through now. Torikin considers himself lucky if he can get 350,000 rupiah or around 24 US dollars a week. It's nowhere near his weekly income of up to 1.8 million rupiah, which he used to get before the pandemic. Tiga minggu saya nggak bisa tidur, tiga lebih, nggak siang nggak malam. Jadi jarang duduk, boro-boro tidur, duduk pun jarang. Karena menghibur rasa sakit itu ya paling jalan, lihat apa. Sedih lah ceritanya. The social and economic upheaval in 1998 is a painful chapter in Indonesia's history. The crisis plunged more than 15 million people into poverty. Indonesia, once the darling of investors, went bankrupt. Large-scale riots also broke out in other cities such as Medan and Solo. But today, the current government is determined to ensure that history will not repeat itself ever again. The country is also financially more stable compared to 20 years ago. The economy is not collapsing right now, while in 1998 it was. The Asian financial crisis was much more severe, um, especially due to the collapse of the uh, rupiah exchange rate, which, uh, yeah, which caused a lot of trouble back in 1998. And a major difference um, between now and then is the way Indonesia went into the crisis. So the buffers currently are stronger, um, economic policies are more focused on macro stability and on financial stability. The exchange rate is more flexible and there's more transparency. So uh, the authorities have come uh, quite a long way uh, over the past decades in making the economy more resilient. Learning from the Asian financial crisis, President Joko Widodo has expanded social safety nets to protect Indonesians from the economic shocks. It includes cash transfers to the poor under the Family Hope Program and Health Insurance System. The beneficiaries of the Staple Food Program has also been expanded to cover 20 million poor Indonesians during the pandemic. Social protection, financial support as well as credit assistance have also been extended to state-owned firms and small private enterprises. But are the measures sufficient to deal with the impact of the major public health catastrophe? Indonesia's Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indrawati says that the government has been doing what it can to alleviate the sufferings of ordinary Indonesians. First, this year, because of this COVID situation, which is affecting both the revenue as well as the spending, we are widening our deficit, which is traditionally or uh, legally, uh, we are only allowed to have a maximum 3% of uh, GDP. Uh, with the special law, which is passed uh, and agreed by the parliament, we are allowed to have more than 3% of GDP. And this year, we are expecting to have 6.3% deficit uh, and that is to cover almost 700 trillion additional spending for the COVID related, including for the economic recovery, as I explained earlier. Now, for this, because of the very steep increase on the deficit, 
we have to discuss on how we are going to finance. So the government responded swiftly with a number of measures, with their relief measures, which include yeah, direct cash transfers, food supplies, uh, guarantees, tax incentives, and the total amount of all this is 4.4% of GDP, which is quite a lot. That will help mitigate the impact of the shock, but it won't offset fully uh, the impact of, of the shock. So, um, but I, I don't think uh, that's possible in, um, in any country in the world um, or here. The government's response uh, for the recovery has been quite strong. The design of the recovery program, um, we have looked at it very carefully, is, uh, is really in, in line with uh, international good practice. What uh, the trick will be, however, is to implement these measures uh, in a speedy manner. The cash for the poor, direct cash to the poor, which is uh, around uh, 600,000 uh, a month. It's equal to 60 Singaporean dollars a month for the people who live below the poverty line. Uh, I mean, who earn less than two dollars a day. And by doing this, the government hope that it will inject the cash into the economy. So far, many Indonesians have displayed enough resilience to weather the economic impact. In Surabaya, Indonesia's second largest city, a traditional mass dance troupe called Riok has stopped performing for months due to the pandemic. They are now running out of money. Social distancing measures, coupled with public fear of coronavirus infection, have led to the cancellation of many events. Kalau krisis moneter, dampaknya lebih parah corona ini. Kalau moneter dulu, kita masih bisa pentas, kita masih dapat pendapatan tiap hari. Paling enggak satu bulan kita masih bisa pentas empat kali. Kalau ini enggak pentas sama sekali, udah lima bulan kita nol, enggak ada pementasan. Udah enggak ada yang dilihat, udah susah sekali, ini, susah. Bukan kita semua, tapi dalam arti semua karya, semua seniman-seniman yang ada di Surabaya susah semua, udah enggak jalan sama sekali. A Riyok troupe usually performs in public cultural and private events. They rely solely on the money from the organizers. In normal times, they can receive up to 1,350 US dollars a month before the pandemic. The money will then be divided among members of the troupe. Sujiyanto has been with the same troupe since he was six. He's now 57. Unlike before, he's now really struggling to make ends meet. In order to survive and support his family, Sujianto has had to sell his TV set and pawn the family's jewelry to help cover his daily expenses. His savings have dwindled to almost nothing. Kita cuma berdoa aja kepada Yang Maha Kuasa, semoga aja virus corona itu bisa keluar dari Pulau Nusantara Indonesia ini. Kalau nggak sampai keluar sampai Januari, wah. Moga-moga aja iman kita kuat. Kalau nggak kuat ya mau gimana lagi, gitu loh. Dalam arti susah udah. Kalau nggak ada yang dilihat, terus cucu menangis, anak menangis, ya kita mau apa lagi? Nowadays, you know, there's always been this debate on, you know, how much longer should we lock down? You know, you're also killing people by killing the economy and so on. Um, my take on it is actually. First, first and foremost, uh, the economy itself is actually supposed to be for the people, right? Economy in itself is kind of a, a process so that a society can function. If there seems to be a contradiction between curing the economy and curing the people, then this contradiction actually indicates a problem in the ways in which the economy is designed in the first place. The government says it is trying its best to ensure the country survives the pandemic. But has it done enough to help the poor from falling deeper into the abyss? 
Surabaya, the provincial capital of East Java. It's also one of the nation's major cities hardest hit by the pandemic. East Java now has the second highest number of infections after Jakarta with more than 37,000 cases and over 2,700 deaths. The grim scenario has forced the government to implement a large-scale social restriction policy to help stem the spread of the disease. It was only a couple of months ago that 39-year-old beautician Lilik Ismawati lost her job as a cosmetic sales assistant in one of Surabaya's glitzy shopping malls. Without customers regularly patronizing the shop, it's simply impossible for her employer to sustain the business. In the end, he was forced to reduce the number of staff to the barest minimum in order to contain costs. Lilik, who lives in Surabaya with her husband and their two young sons, were among those who had to go. Despite the loss of her income of around 230 US dollars a month, Lilik has not lost hope. Selama pandemik ini nggak ada sama sekali pemasukan sama sekali, makanya putar otak bikin usaha sendiri itu. Setelah Pandemik ini sebenarnya kepingin mengembangkan usaha sendiri sih mbak, baik itu cireng atau merias, saya kepingin berkembang. Soalnya kan nggak selamanya ikut orang terus. Saya juga apa menawarkan lewat Instagram juga ada saya memberanikan diri untuk posting posting aja hasil karya saya. Jadi dari situ orang kan bisa melihat foto dan hasil hasilnya. Lilik has learned how to make it chirang from her sister. The snack is very popular among Indonesians. It's made of a mixture of tapioca flour, garlic, chopped spring onions and a pinch of pepper. Her husband Muhammad Muniyev helps her promote the snack online and deliver them directly to their customers. Muniev himself has had to take a massive pay cut from his regular job as an employee of a private company. He's now required to come to the office only once a week. On a busy day, the couple can earn up to 14 US dollars. It's a tough business to begin with, but they're grateful for it as it helps to put food on the table. Suami saya kebetulan kan masih ada BPJS untuk kesehatan sih masih ditanggung. Cuman untuk yang lain-lain nggak ada sama sekali selama pandemik dari awal sampai sekarang nggak ada bantuan dari tidak pernah menerima bantuan dari pemerintah sama sekali. But the reality is the government has set aside trillions of rupiah to help the poor during the pandemic. Less than half of the money has been used so far. Analysts have put the blame on bureaucratic red tape, inadequate data of applicants, and the country's sheer size for the slow distribution of aid. The, the government, uh, uh, rightly, is and must be very worried, as uh, we all are. In fact, all governments around the world are very much worried right now and are uh, struggling to, uh, to come up with uh, responses. The Indonesian government um, has uh, very uh, rapidly responded. Um, as you know, they, uh, the government has uh, set up a, a response and economic uh, mitigation and, uh, and recovery uh, package, which focuses on health, uh, it focuses on people, and it focuses on businesses. So um, this was a, a came very quickly. It was uh, um, um, well done. It's difficult for us to track how much expect, uh, exact, exactly has been spent so far, um, but we do expect a deficit, a fiscal deficit of close to 6% of GDP. Um, but we, we see the challenges of the government to, yeah, to, to, to reach all, all the people who need relief uh, and to spend all the money that has been allocated so far. Indonesia has allocated around 200 trillion rupiah or around 14 billion US dollars stimulus package for social assistance. It is part of nearly 700 trillion rupiah or 48 billion US dollars which have been set aside to safeguard the economy during the pandemic. 
The social assistance package includes direct cash transfers of around 40 US dollars a month as well as direct handouts in the form of basic food items to the poor. The government has begun paying 13-month salaries amounting to nearly 2 billion US dollars to civil servants and state pensioners. The main objective is to revive consumer spending, boost sluggish demand and prevent the country from sliding into recession. Emil Dadak is the vice governor of East Java. He said the government is pulling out all the stops to make sure the assistance reach the poor. Of course, the fact is we need to quickly ensure that they, they have enough uh, you know, uh, means to sustain their life. And by that, I'm, I'm saying as simple as ensuring that we support them with uh, cash support or even food support uh, for those that are most uh, affected uh, and most vulnerable. Most 40% of the uh, population in Indonesia are, are then included in this data set. We are really maxing, maximizing all the resources coming from within, that is government-owned resources, for example, our uh, sovereign wealth fund uh, for education or any other fund which is uh, uh, managed by the government, they have become one of the source uh, which is uh, provided for, uh, for this deficit financing. In addition to that, we also use our bilateral and multilateral support, uh, which is also they are providing more uh, room for us to, to borrow, for example, World Bank, ADB, uh, AIIB, and also from some bilateral government. And then we issue bonds both globally and domestically. While East Java is predominantly urban, with the manufacturing sector contributing to around 30% of the local economy, agriculture has proven to be resilient during the crisis. It's growing at around 2% in the second quarter, while other sectors suffered steep declines. In the remote Toraja Highlands on the island of Sulawesi, the death of the tourism industry has encouraged some locals to return to agriculture and rebuild their lives all over again. Yosef Pali Limbongan is one of them. Before the pandemic, the 57-year-old ran a guest house and managed local tours in the city centre. But he decided to return to his hometown and tend to the family's rice fields soon after he lost his job. He wants to make sure the family has enough food to eat during the lockdown. COVID-19, I have been working for 20 years. Now, there will be COVID-19 for the life of the family. There is no other way to be a farmer. When we come back to the family, we have been working for about 4 hectares. And for the people who want to sell, we don't have any way to be a farmer. The most important thing is that we can live for the family. Kita juga beternak kecil-kecilan dan membuat eh, membuat kios sembako. Yosef's monthly income has dropped by more than 70% to 2 million rupiah or around 137 US dollars since the pandemic began. He's selling basic essentials such as rice, sugar and cooking oil to make ends meet. But the harsh reality is, there are other people who are less fortunate than him. Setelah adanya COVID-19 ini memang ada bantuan dari pemerintah, tetapi eh, untuk keluarga saya tidak saya menolak karena saya bilang lebih, masih banyak yang lebih membutuhkan. They might have lost their incomes from the uh, tourism, but if if we look at whether they are able to fulfill their basic needs, it seems that they, they can still fulfill their basic needs. They might not get the money, but they manage to fulfill their needs. The economic impact of COVID-19 is not just on Indonesia. It's actually worldwide. So in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand are already predicted to have negative economic growth. Yeah? This prediction means there will be many jobs lost if they are not lost already. 
For many Indonesians who have lost their jobs and main source of income because of the crisis, their main and perhaps only hope for survival is cash assistance from the government. Whether in urban or rural areas, the situation that the poor are in are equally dire. Just like snack maker Lilik Ismawati in Surabaya, or three-wheel taxi driver Torikim, they have yet to receive any help from the government. Nggak di kampung, nggak di sini saya nggak dapat. Di kampung pun nggak, nggak ada. Ini bukannya saya pengen dibelas kasihan ya? Demi Rasulullah, Allah Maha Adil, Maha Tahu. Saya belum pernah menerima bantuan atas nama si A, atas nama saya gitu, atau istri saya. Di sini pun begitu. Di tanah saya, saya tinggalnya di tinggal di rumah itu udah sepuluh puluhan tahun. Bagi yang punya anak banyak yang kasihan. Anaknya masih pada kecil-kecil. Kalau kan kondisi seperti ini berlalu terus, mau bagaimana? Ibaratnya kalau kayak saya sama istri saya pulang kampung, ibaratnya makan singkong. Atau makan seadanya di kamu kalau saya rajin. For Indonesia as a big country with 200 million people, even our social safety net program, which is covering 20 million poorest family in Indonesia, they are uh, not always capturing all the real poor people. There is always an exclusion inclusion error. Those with the exclusion is mean those who are supposed to be in this database, they are not yet in that database. Our challenge is that since 2015, the updating of the poor family data has been delegated to the local government. And unfortunately, not all local government updating those data until this COVID then hit in 2020. Indonesia is running against time to save millions of citizens who depend on the government to survive the pandemic. But what more can the government do to help cushion the economic impact of the pandemic, especially on the poor and the vulnerable segments of the population? Since the pandemic began early this year, more than 6 million Indonesians have lost their jobs. Tens of millions of people are also facing the risk of losing their main source of livelihoods as a result of the strict social distancing measures. Many of the poor who work mostly in the informal sectors are worried and have strong doubts over the future. What happens if they fall ill? What if they're evicted from their houses for not paying their rent? And will they face the prospect of hunger and starvation when their incomes dry up? Leader of the traditional Javanese dance troupe Ryok, Mr. Sujiyanto has had to sell off almost all of his personal belongings so that his family has something to eat, after the pandemic killed off his main source of income. Kita punya nyapa kita gadaikan, terutama kita menggadaikan BPKB, terus TV, yang terakhir kita membagikan cincin, cincin kawin lah istilahnya. <laughs> Gimana lagi, udah nggak ada yang, kalau orang Jawa bilangnya ya gak bisa tole-tole udah, ya kita gadaikan yang kita punya gitu aja, yang penting kita bisa makan setiap harinya. Daripada nanti anak nggak makan, kelaparan ya caranya gimana, yang penting kita bisa makan. Stories of hunger. Poverty and joblessness have now become a common thread that link many of the more vulnerable segments of the population in Indonesia these days. Bajaj driver Torikim, for example, has been in physical pain for more than a month now. The injury to his index finger has become worse, but until today, he has not seen a doctor to tend to his wound. He can't even afford to pay for his daily needs, let alone seek medical treatment. Udah hampir satu bulan semenjak sakit. Pas kena sakit saya di sini udah satu bulan. Kesannya, kenyataannya saya pu, duit 200 ribu aja saya nggak punya. Istri saya nyusul di sini, nyusul dari kampung ke sini. Saya nggak punya duit. Nggak punya duit, gedenya 200 ribu. Makanya saya sakit, saya tahan, tahan. Ya namanya orang sakit begini. <tuh> Mau ke dokter kan takut mahal. 
ibaratnya punya duit 200 ribu kan nggak berani ke dokter takut dia mutasi lah itu dan ini yang namanya dokter kalau cuma disuntik doang itu kan mungkin berkelasnya cuma 100 ribu ya tapi kalau namanya dibelek apa dioperasi itu kan walaupun kecil itu kan mungkin biayanya lumayan makanya saya tahan 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 ya timbulnya infeksi seperti ini Indonesia has raised a record of 18 trillion rupiah or around 1.2 billion US dollars from retail bond sales. It has also secured some 9.9 billion dollars from global bonds since the beginning of this year to help mitigate the impact of the coronavirus outbreak. The move is also part of its continuous efforts to pluck millions of Indonesians from poverty and reverse the impact of the health crisis. So the, so, the, so the prudent fiscal policies of past years basically uh, allows for the room to spend on relief measures uh, in the current situation in 2020. Um, so, and, and that's what the government is doing. So the government spends, uh, I think, close to 4.4% 4. 4. of GDP uh, in terms of relief measures. Um, and it so the, and and the, the prudent fiscal policies of the past basically uh, provide the room to do so now. In August this year, President Joko Widodo unveiled a budget worth 185 billion US dollars for the year 2021 to put the economy back on track through increased spending. The government has also set aside some 420 trillion rupiah or 28 billion US dollars as a form of a social safety net for the poor. About 170 trillion rupiah or 11 billion US dollars have also been allocated to meet the growing demands for healthcare services. These kinds of ad hoc interventions to the health systems, right? It actually indicates that there is a problem uh, in designing the economy that the, 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 the healthcare has always been, has not been a priority. Yeah. Um, we can see how many, uh, how many hospitals are there uh, outside Java uh, and what is the quality there. And uh, so how much has it been, uh, uh, it, this is basically just basic needs, right? Provision of basic needs. If we go back to the definition of poverty again, uh, how would we expect that uh, the areas uh, that with high incidences of poverty uh, would be able to get the opportunity to fulfill this healthcare needs if the facilities are not sufficient? Bajaj driver Tori Kim can only hope that help will come sooner rather than later. He also would like to see a sense of normality returning to the streets of Jakarta to help ease his financial burden. Nah, tapi kalau yang hidup di Jakarta, kalau kondisi ini berlarut-larut bagaimana? Harapan saya mudah-mudahan COVID-COVID seperti ini cepat berlalu lah. Biar semua aktivitas normal seperti biasa. Itu harapan saya. Ya, terutama bagi pemerintah lah. Jadi misalkan meliput berita itu jangan berlebihan lah, biar masyarakat itu nggak pada takut. Kan semua masyarakat orang pada takut, COVID ini takut tertular. For others, such as fried chicken seller and grab driver Hisam Masruri, he can't wait for the return of the good old days. COVID-19 and the subsequent lockdowns have exacted a heavy toll on the lives of many people, including his family. They believe that reopening the economy will help relieve their financial burden and allow them to get back on their feet again. Kawan saya memang ada di orang sebentar. Waktu 2019 itu sebelum COVID dia saya kenal dia masih sehat masih normal. Berapa bulan nggak ketemu semenjak COVID kan PSBB itu <tuh> empat bulan tiga tiga atau empat bulan setelah saya ketemu tuh udah dikatakan gila. Tapi kalau masih si COVID ini beritanya masih terus diberitakan, terus diupdate terus zona merah, zona ini, zona itu, nggak bakal normal. Bahkan mungkin sampai kiamat pun nggak bakal normal kalau masih tetap begini-gini aja. Normal itu kan kalau kita tanya sendiri mau normal. 
udah semua normal pabriknya jalan lagi orang sekolah masuk lagi kan roda kembali muter lagi yang narik ojek online ada penumpangnya with the economy expected to contract this year it remains uncertain if growth will bounce back in the short term President Joko Widodo says COVID-19 cases will peak in September and that will have a negative impact on growth for the rest of the year. The economy is expected to pick up again next year, but only if the pandemic is over. I think we are still within 0% into minus uh, 0.5, but it could be deeper into minus 1 to 0%. But this is really depend on the fourth quarter that we are uh, aiming to have a better recovery. And then for next year, we've already discussed with the parliament, uh, the growth estimation is between 4.5 to 5.5. Until today, many Indonesians are hoping that the various social restriction measures will be lifted soon. But the stark reality is, many of them are now left disappointed. Just last week, the government announced that the capital city Jakarta will have to endure another round of strict restrictions due to the rising COVID-19 cases. The impact of such measures on the livelihoods of ordinary Indonesians will be hard to imagine. Food seller and grab driver Hisam Masruri feels that he has little choice now but to go along with the new tough measures and persevere for as long as he can however tough it may be for him and his family. Saya susah. Tapi masih banyak orang yang lebih susah dari saya. Bahkan ada orang yang sampai tinggal di jalan karena nggak mampu bayar sewa kontrakan. Ada orang-orang yang terpaksa pulang kampung karena memang di PHK gitu. Ada orang-orang yang sampai gulung tiker dagangannya karena nggak mampu bayar lapak, nggak mampu bayar karyawan. Banyak cerita yang menurut saya sih the COVID-19 pandemic has deepened the social and economic divisions within the society. The poor were already struggling to eke out a living before the start of the outbreak. But now they're finding it a lot harder to break their poverty cycle due to the sudden loss of income and livelihoods in the wake of the pandemic. Many of them are hoping and praying that brighter days will return and that difficult times will soon pass, preferably a lot sooner rather than later. This is really a very hard situation for all. I think uh, regardless where is your social position or economic position, because COVID is indiscriminate. I think you can always like, you are affected in many different ways. It could be your family, it could be your job, it could be many things. So it's really a very hard situation for all. The government will do at, uh, their best in order for us to be able to continue support uh, the people life. Uh, the strength and the resiliency of the Indonesian people is actually on their ability to adapt and adjust. Of course, maybe on the one side, we don't have uh, a social protection which is formal and legalized. But that's also creating a strength in the form of people solidarity is actually uh, appear and can be seen in many uh, different ways.